hey, uh, we're supposed to do that promo for um, uh, Mr. Media, so. I mean, I'm, I'm Charlotte Barrett. I'm Sean Fallon, and you've chosen to listen to this Mr. Website, Media. This website, if you want. You are listening to Mr. Media, <laughs> if you've gotten this far. If you haven't, I'm sorry. Today on Mr. Media, I'll talk to Mick Herbacherier, co-author of Directing, Film Techniques and Aesthetics, a detailed textbook approach to cinema's most enigmatic job. The book was recently updated for its fifth edition. Stick around, and remember, all hail the director. Unless, of course, you're the producer. Those guys bow to no one. Today's episode of Mr. Media Interviews is brought to you by GoDaddy.com. You know GoDaddy.com from their wild and sexy commercials, but isn't it time you actually test drove their web hosting and domain registration services yourself? For a limited time, Mr. Media listeners can save 10% on the already low price of web hosting services at GoDaddy.com by entering the promo code POD4 at checkout. Again, that's 10% off web hosting when you go to GoDaddy.com and enter the promo code POD4, that's P-O-D, the number 4, at checkout. Mr. Media is recorded live before a studio audience of grips, best boys, and second unit ADs in the new new media capital of the world, St. Petersburg, Florida. Somebody interrupting you there? No, oh, okay. I'm looking for the grips. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got me there. All right. The way I've always seen the job of the film director is someone whose talents must encompass all of the primary men and women around him or her. The screenwriter, for example, the cinematographer, the producer, and so on. Now, we all know the stereotype of the director who holds his fingers up in opposing uh, L-shapes, you know, this whole thing, uh, to signify the film frame and uh, to demonstrate to an audience of uh, professionals what should be in a shot. But before becoming the project's adjunct cameraman, the director must be part screenwriter, able to read and envision ways to best translate the words and stage directions in a raw script, uh, either by rewriting it or telling the original writer what's missing. And in today's world, more and more directors must wear part of the producer's hat as well, understanding budget constraints in ways that previous generations may not have. Now, perhaps all of that contributes to why most cu cultures revere and respect director above most any other credit in a movie. Now, who can't name a handful of directors on request? Uh, Spielberg, Tarantino, Lee, and that could be Spike or Ang, uh, Bigelow, and Cameron, uh, are mod they're all modern masters. And what about classics such as Hitchcock, Kurosawa, or Ford? Okay, so now try naming a producer who's not named Weinstein. All right. See? Director's rule. All of which is why I thought it would be fun to invite Hunter College filmmaking professor uh, Mick Herbus Cherier to the show today. The masterful textbook that he and Michael Rabiger authored, it's uh, Directing, Film Techniques and Aesthetics, has been freshly updated for its fifth edition. And as the father of a filmmaker in the making, I need to keep up on this stuff. Mick, welcome to Mr. Media. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, well, that, that would make two of us. Uh, yeah. I appreciate that. Um, now, it's very important to start out. Did I accurately uh, capture the essence of the director in my description, or what did I miss? You know, I think you uh, described it accurately, but only partially. I mean, one of the things about being a director, uh, you know, you, it, it requires an enormous amount of flexibility. Not just, uh, uh, you know, there isn't just one job description. It really depends on the project that the director is involved in. Um, if it's a low-budget project, if it's a project that they originate, or if it's a project that's handed to them. 
um, if it's a studio project. These require different skills and different kinds of directorial approaches. Um, so really a director has to be very flexible uh, and very knowledgeable about the entire process uh, and about um, all the other creative people who, and about the jobs of all the other creative people who work on that project. Mm. Uh, the director really holds it all together, right? He's kind of at the, he would kind of be the, 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 the red hot blazing sun at the center of the solar system. Yeah, you know, um, to a certain extent what a director does, and, and the metaphor that we use, one of the metaphors we use in the book is kind of like the conductor of an orchestra. The, 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 the conductor doesn't have to be uh, a virtuoso on every instrument in the, in the orchestra, but they do have to understand every instrument in the orchestra. They have to understand the, 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 the um, creative capacity of every instrument in the orchestra. And what, and, and what the director does is holds it all together. So you have a number of creative individuals who are contributing to this project, to the film. You have a writer, a cinematographer, a set designer, um, uh, the actors, uh, the sound uh, uh, designer, the editors. And the director is the through line, the creative through line, the one who makes sure that all the creative energies of all these people, uh, actually there is a unified vision to their, to their efforts and uh, um, that, that all their efforts actually hold together in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, you know, a good film. So the direct, I mean, help me out here. I'm thinking that the part of it is if you're the director, and that's at any level of film, if you understand what these different craftspeople do, uh, and I don't say crafts people like craft services, the food people. I mean, right. whatever they do, whatever their their trade is, uh, you can get more out of your film because you know what they can do and probably what they can't do. So you're going to ask them to do things that they can do. And maybe they don't quite know it, but maybe you know what they can do because you've had experiences with other people at that trade. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. You know, the the... the, the the sort of stereotypic idea of a director is that they uh, that they have this grand idea and they come in with a vision, and they get this crew together to realize their vision. Um, in fact, um, smart directors know that they have to uh, collaborate with each of those creative professionals in order to arrive at uh, uh, their grand their grand vision. Um, if you think about it, you know a director is lucky to make a film every two or three, even four years. But a really good cinematographer is making four films a year, or a sound designer is designing four films a year. So these uh, creative uh, professionals have a lot of experience in solving, um, you know, the, the, in, 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 in solving these challenges of bringing something that's literary, a screenplay, to the screen. And so a smart director will actually collaborate and ask the advice of these people who have done this many, many times. And some of the advice, uh, some of the ideas uh, don't work toward what the director is, is, is um, uh, getting at, or dramatically speaking. Um, and some of them will actually enhance the story. And so slowly, step by step, a director uh, builds, um, Let's just say this, the, the, the vision of a film actually evolves through the interactions, through the collaboration that the director has with all these other creative people. Mm. So they're more like a foreman than they are uh, sort of a captain of a ship. You know, they're not ordering people around. <laughs> they're, they're, uh, they're, harnessing, they're harnessing the creative energy of a group of um, you know, people who are there actually to, to help realize the director's ideas. Now, a lot of the most famous directors tend to be very... Very big personalities, a lot of ego, uh, and yet you would think from the description that you give that they would be people who would be very respectful and very patient, but yeah. th th it doesn't necessarily always work that way, does it? Well, I think the big ego directors are the ones that we hear about. They're fun to write about. They're, they're interesting to interview, uh, but um, there's a lot of big directors out there who work just as, as I uh, am discussing, you know, someone like uh, John and Demi who uh, is a fabulous director, uh, really a very wide uh, range of skill and, and, uh, and um, uh, what do I want to say, a wide range of cinematic approaches, uh, very collaborative with this crew, creates a great energy uh, on the sets, even down to the, uh, the um, interns, production assistants. Everybody feels sort of involved in the making of this film. Um, I was just uh, 
talking to uh, Courtney Hunt, who had a great film called Frozen River, an independent film. Oh, yeah. Very, yeah. I had Melissa Leo on the show. Oh, fabulous. Well, I mean, they're very difficult film to shoot. Uh, the weather, the budget constraints. And one of the things that uh, she said to me, that Courtney Hunt said to me, is, you know, I, if, if, the, if I was going to expect these people to stay with me for this, sh this winter, outdoor winter shoot, I had to make them all really feel and really be invested in the shooting and participate in the shooting of this film. Mm -hmm. So um, um, that you know, a smart director will do that, relieve themselves of the burden of having to make the whole entire film uh, on their own and, uh, and sort of uh, tap into the resources that they have. Um, you know, but we like to hear about the the big egos, <laughs> so that's that's what's out there. But uh, but uh, not necessarily, not necessarily. Are there directors that succeed even though maybe they're only good at certain parts of the job? Like, um, you know, maybe they're good at the uh, at understanding the cinematography, but maybe they're not the best at rewriting a script or 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 that kind of thing. Does anyone come to mind that way? Oh yeah, for sure. I mean. Um, um, you know, uh, Woody Allen is somebody who's very script oriented, um, uh, and he gets the story down on the script. His his uh, cinematography, his shooting is pretty. Um, I'm not gonna say utilitarian, but it's pretty simple. And a lot of the times, he leaves that up to the the cinematographer. Uh, he he. There are certain stagings that he likes to do, mostly because he's not really that concerned with uh, too much visual interpretation. He does, just doesn't want the camera to get in the way of the actors. Mm -hmm. However, he also doesn't do too much directing of the actors. It, all of his directing really comes in the casting of, of, the, of the performers. And once he casts the performers and they're right for the role and he's confident in what they can bring to the role, he just lets them bring it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just, I just watched these two, uh, it's, I guess it's a two-part documentary on him. Uh, I watched it on Netflix when I was... Uh, homesick a few days uh, about a month ago and uh, uh, it was really interesting to listen to uh, the cinematographers talk about him and him I mean yeah. you know other than I mean the, the one film of his that really stands out I guess for the cinematography I think is Manhattan yeah. and then you know the others you really don't think about them I, mean, I guess a bit the um, Midnight in Paris you know it, the, the way he captures uh, Paris yeah. is important a little but, bit of Stardust memories also right right but it's yeah. not uh, uh, it's that's not the thing you remember about a Woody Allen movie. It's yeah, generally, exactly. Generally not the same. Um, you know, and, and there are quite a few directors. Uh, you know, you, you as a director, you really have to understand the power of um, of editing. But in fact, there is a lot of directors who are not allowed in the editing room uh, because what happens is uh, directors often um, become uh, uh, married to the footage. That they have shot, uh, uh, they they remember how hard it was to get certain shots, and they 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 want to include these these scenes in there. And that, you know, uh, the the skill of an editor is very different. The skill of an editor is working with what is actually there uh, to make the best film possible. Mm -hmm. So uh, so everything gets rewritten even in in that particular stage. So so there's a lot of editor, uh, a lot of directors who, while they understand that process, uh, um, are, are not really good at seeing the whole thing fresh. Uh, in post-production, so they, they're basically not allowed uh, near the editing room. Now, I want to tell folks, uh, they've seen the cover of, of your book already, Directing. Okay. It is yeah. a big, massive book about directing. I mean, it's, there's discussion and, and there's yeah. all kinds of stuff in here. And I'm not, in the, in the time that we have, going to try to go through a lot of the technical stuff <laughs> here because I don't know that I'm qualified to do it. But I am interested in things like, you know, what kind of characteristics – uh, do you want students who read the book or just people who are not necessarily students but are interested in directing what are some of the better characteristics of a director that you want them to take away when they when they read this or, or uh, tasks or you know uh, some of the most important things that you want them to walk away from the book with well you know um, <clears throat> one of the things uh, you know one of the things about a book is its function the, the function of a book and the education of any kind of filmmaker or creative person um, you can't really learn everything you need to learn from a book. That's that's, and in fact, the book sometimes a book is sometimes not the best way to learn things. Um, um, I would say uh, that, of course, doing it is the most important way of learning, especially with directing. You just do it, and you learn by your successes, uh, your victories, and you learn by your mistakes. But there are a lot of little mistakes that people do along the way that can be avoided uh, by uh, by reading a book. 
Um, so um, I would say that the, the, fir the first thing, and we encourage this throughout the book, is to just get out there and do it and don't be afraid of making mistakes. And, uh, and that's a lot easier to do now that uh, you can do, you know, quite beautiful, very viable uh, projects uh, with little money on um, high definition video. Um, so uh, I think, so, so, so getting out there and doing it is one of the things that we encourage everybody, anybody who's interested in being a director and not, uh, especially when you're starting out, not believing that every project is so precious that you can't just take risks, uh, make a few mistakes and learn from those mistakes. Mm. Um, the other thing is, uh, you'll notice as you flip through the book, there's an enormous number of films that we reference as yeah. examples. Um, everything from classic cinema, uh, uh, you know, from a Man of the Movie Camera or uh, M uh, to uh, 500 Days of Summer and, uh, you know, The Fighter, uh, The King's Speech. Um, that's, a, that's the second way we learn about making films, is by watching films, watching the movies of other people, seeing what they do, seeing what their technique is, seeing how they solve these problems of taking the script and bringing it to the screen. Um, so we put in um, as many... Uh, what, we, what we did was we put in films that we believe that if students go to those films, they're going to learn something about filmmaking. They may learn about the sound aspect. I have Alfred Hitchcock's uh, The Man Who Knew Too Much, which is a film that is just like a textbook in dealing with sound. Um, they may learn about uh, editing. You know, if you look at Raging Bull, Raging Bull has almost, uh, you know, all the great uh, uh, editing techniques. Um, uh, uh, screenwriting, you know, we do a lot on um, the King's Speech uh, for screenwriting. So watching films, analyzing films uh, for technique, but also for inspiration is, is very important also. Um, and then um, the third is then reading the book and, and learning as much as you can before you go out there and start spending your money and wasting your money on, on you know, making simple mistakes that could be uh, avoided. I think, though, that... Um, that the, the, one of the uh, main things about the book, what it's dedicated to is, and this is one of the first things that, uh, that students learn when they go to film school, is that directing is not something you do just on the set when the camera is rolling. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, 90% of directing happens in pre-production. It happens when you are casting the film and finding your actors. It happens when you are consulting with your cinematographer about how you're going to cover each scene. It happens when you first read the script and analyze the script for what are the dramatic arcs, what are the dramatic, uh, the, the principal dramatic beats of this of this uh, particular you know scene or the entire script. Um, it happens in your consultation with the sound people. It happens in your, with your consultation with the set designers. How are you envisioning this world? So 90% of your work and, and a huge percentage of this book is dedicated to what the director does in pre-production. Mm. And oftentimes um, in their, a young director in their um, enthusiasm and eagerness to get their hands on a camera and start shooting and looking at footage, they will skip over a lot of those really critical steps in pre-production. Mm. And then they'll find themselves uh, standing in the middle of a set with the crew looking at them saying, okay, what do we do now? And they haven't even thought about it. You know? So that's, I think, one of the most important things that this book um, um, is dedicated to. And also just, just, uh, just know the things that a director needs to know. Okay. Uh, we talk a lot, a, a lot about technology. Like, how does a director approach technology? Does a director have to know everything about technology? You know, it's such a it's such a crazy world out there. The technology changes, you know, every month. Um, you know, whether you're talking about video formats or wrapper formats or um, sound technology, uh, editing technology. Do I need a red camera this week? Um, unbelievable. Yeah, exactly. And and now there's rumors that there's going to be, you know, there's 2K, 4K. Now they're talking about 6K, and it's just. But does a director need to know all that stuff? Mm -hmm. Um, and so we talk a lot about what aspects of technology that a director really should know so that they can be um, eloquent with this technology, visually eloquent with this technology, um, and what technology they can leave to the crew that they've hired. 
you know, the, the crew that they have around them, the crew that is there who are experts with the camera or with the sound recorder or what have you. So um, it's, it's, uh, that's, a, that's a skill that we hope that uh, people reading the book will come away with, directors uh, will come away with, is like uh, uh, what I can leave to the crew and what I really do need to know. Uh, yeah, I was going to ask you about if the uh, after cinematographer and scriptwriter and producer, uh, th that was one of my questions actually. I was going to ask you if the director has to become a technologist now, uh, and probably they do. Some of them, of course, excel at it, like Cameron. I mean, yes. that's yeah. become his big thing. But the opposite end of that, I guess, is Tarantino, who swears and vows he will not go to digital. He will not shoot yeah. digital. But yeah. you just have to assume that's going to happen because there won't be any film out there left for him to make his movies with. Well, you know, you have to, it, it's, it's a balance, you know, a director has to know what tools they're using. I mean, one of the things that you'll look, see in the film is that we talk a lot about lenses. Uh, we talk about a lot about um, uh, lenses and perspective. What's the difference between a, 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 a close-up that's shot with a, with a telephoto lens versus a, the same shot shot with a wide-angle lens? This is a visually expressive issue that directors really need to know. They need to know about perspective. They need to know about lenses. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, do they necessarily need to know that it's best to record on a hard drive or a P2 card? Or it, it, That may not be, the you know, what's necessary for them. But um, you can get, uh, you have to, so you have to know some technology, but you can, a, a director can also go overboard in thinking they have to know everything. Mm -hmm. I can tell you a story. Recently, a, um, a student of mine from maybe four years ago just shot his first feature film and he came into my office and he was very proud Mick I just shot my first feature film we had this beautiful red camera we shot it in 3k and he was telling me all the technical specifications of the camera and how they got the camera and and how that allowed for this kind of lighting and that kind of lighting you know after half an hour of, of how proud they were that they got this red camera and they're gonna be editing with the software that handles red code raw codec I said, well, you want to tell me what the story was about? <laughs> what was your movie about? Yeah. Oh, right. And so this is what happens if directors become too concerned or overwhelmed by technology. They start to forget the whole creative aspect, the perennial aspects of what it means to be a director. You're telling a story. Uh, you're communicating with actors so that they are convincingly telling your story. You know, so these are the things, um, you're, you know, you're creating a visual world. And these are the things that are important for a director to, to really, really focus on. And to a certain extent, the crew is there to protect the director from having to think about stuff that's not germane to what, you know, what's happening in front of the camera. Well, we've got about a minute or two left, unfortunately. Oh, wow. I, I could keep, yeah, I could, I could keep talking about this for quite a while, trust me. But well, i, I got to ask you, this is the fifth edition of the book. Yes. And maybe in the last minute or two, you could take and explain what is different from this edition, from the fourth edition, and really in the big picture from the very first edition. How much has it changed? But unfortunately, you only get a minute or two to do that. All right. Well, the book is really the, the first four editions were written by Michael Rabiger. This is really his book. And I was brought in for the fifth edition oh. um, because the book needed uh, to be trimmed a little bit. It had grown a little awkward over the number of editions. Um, it needed some updating, some new films. Um, and uh, really what I brought into it was some new discussion about uh, dramatic basics, um, about uh, script analysis. I brought in a new discussion about the language of cinema, um, both uh, the shot and the editing. Um, all the uh, film examples are new, um, uh, and I brought in the new film examples um, uh, throughout the book. Um, the, the, a lot of the, 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 the directing actor stuff remains from the previous editions. Uh, you know, this was a beloved book. It was first published in 1988 or 89, something like that. And, and a lot of people love this book. And so what I tried to do was leave the stuff that people really loved and, uh, and enhance the, the stuff that, that had maybe gotten a little stale or a little confused over the years. It's interesting. I'm, I'm, I, I love the book, and I'm, I'm looking forward to Thanks. sharing it with my, uh, with my kid who's starting to think about film schools and stuff. You want to put in a pit, pitch for, uh, for your school? Uh, it's a film school at this point? Oh, yeah. I teach up at Hunter College at the City University of New York. Uh, we have a film program there. It's a small film program. There are maybe 150, 200 majors, uh, five faculty. 
But I'll tell you, the faculty that teaches at the at Hunter College, uh, they're as good as any faculty anywhere in the country. Um, and it is a small program, so you get a lot of uh, attention. You will, for sure, get full-time faculty teaching you. We don't have that many adjuncts. <laughs> um, but they are a great group of faculty. It's a, they're very fine, and they're all working filmmakers. Very good. All right. Well, uh, folks, listen, you can find uh, Directing Film Techniques and Aesthetics, written by Michael Rabiger and my guest, Mick Herbis Cherrier, uh, in great stores everywhere. He's smiling because I think I got his name right, pronounced right. Perfectly. All right. It's in great stores everywhere, or order it right now at a great price at MrMedia.com. Uh, Mick, do you have a website, a Twitter, Facebook, anything you want to direct folks to? Uh, it would be best if they go to the Focal Press uh, website. They're directing at uh, Focal Press, uh, or they can see it on, on Amazon. All right. Very yeah. good. Well, Mick, uh, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Oh, uh, were you going to add something, please? Oh, they could also. I have another book uh, that I wrote before this one called Voice and Vision, which uh, this one, you know, the directing concentrates on directing, but the Voice and Vision uh, uh, is a more technical book and talks a lot uh you know about the the technical aspects of film production. All right, very good. Good job to you getting an extra plug in there. Yeah, that's. that's <laughs> <thank you. laughs> All right, Mick. Thank you uh, so much. It was a really interesting conversation. And thank you so much for joining us, Mr. Media, today. Thanks so much, Bob. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Ciao. You can see and hear almost a thousand Mr. Media interviews by visiting our main site. MrMedia.com, MRMedia.com. Or check out the more than 200 video interviews on the Mr. Media radio site on YouTube. And I'd sure appreciate if you'd show some love for Mr. Media's advertisers, including Stitcher. Apple named Stitcher a top five news app of 2011. It's a free mobile app for your smartphone or tablet that lets you listen to your favorite shows and discover the best of news, entertainment, and sports on demand. You can listen whenever you want to, to more than 5,000 shows, get customized recommendations, and discover what your friends are listening to. My own list of Stitcher favorites is pretty eclectic. I start my day with an hour of MSNBC's Morning Joe with Joe Scarborough and Mika Brzezinski. Then it's the latest two-minute update from the Onion News Network. After that, I'll listen to WTF with Mark Marin. Here's the Thing with Alec Baldwin, HBO's Real Time with Bill Maher, and excerpts from E's Chelsea Lately and The Soup with Joel McHale. Also in regular rotation on my Stitcher playlist, The BS Report with ESPN's Bill Simmons, The Tech Crunch Headlines, and The Don Geronimo Show. The latest episodes of each show, whether originating from broadcasts, cable TV, radio syndication, or podcasts, are continuously updated. Stitcher is a free app for your iPhone, iPad, Kindle, Fire, Blackberry, Droid, and more. And show your support of Mr. Media by getting, did I mention it's free? The app at stitcher.com slash Mr. Media. That's stitcher.com slash MR Media. Stitcher Smart Radio, the smarter way to listen to radio. We're also supported by Audible. Check out Audible's 30-day trial membership and download the audiobook version of the book everyone's been talking about, Fifty Shades of Grey by E.L. James. Sign up for your free trial today at audible.com slash radio. Again, audibletrial.com slash radio. And finally, if you need a disc jockey for a wedding, bar mitzvah, corporate event, or just a big old party, please consider calling 1-800-DIAL-DJs, the party authority, for all your party entertainment needs. You can call 1-800-DIAL-DJs or go to their website, 1-800-DIAL-DJs.com. And tell them Mr. Media sent you. And thanks for listening. Today's episode of Mr. Media Interviews is brought to you by GoDaddy.com. You know GoDaddy.com from their wild and sexy commercials, but isn't it time you actually test drove their web hosting and domain registration services yourself? 
For a limited time, Mr. Media listeners can save 10% on the already low price of web hosting services at GoDaddy.com by entering the promo code POD4 at checkout. Again, that's 10% off web hosting when you go to GoDaddy.com and enter the promo code POD4, that's P-O-D, the number 4, at checkout. 